uh, address what's happening with happiest minds and we've got Venkat uh, Raman Narayanan, the MD and CFO at the company joining in on the show right now. Venkat, hi, morning. Good to have you on the show. Uh, to begin with, Venkat, can you explain the rationale of the stake sale by Mr. Suta just yesterday? Also, will, be the, uh, will there be any more such pairing of stake? Uh, good morning. Let me uh, cover the point on the stake sale. Uh, when we when we recast the vision for the company uh, about three years back post IPO, we said that we are designing and building a company for perpetuity. And one of the key conditions or one of the key things that was to be done at that point in time is to make sure make sure that the controlling stakeholder of the promoter is uh, you know protected at uh, somewhere around forty percent. That that's been made public. Subsequently, we have also uh, said that Mr. Suta is uh, engaged in uh, doing uh, the non-profit activities of his through an organization called SCAM, and he has been uh, contributing a substantial part of his wealth and his earnings towards that. He's also having another company called Happiest Health, which is uh, associated with wellness, health and wellness, primarily which, which got him start, which is something that he started after COVID. So with all of this, he has been saying this consistently that he would be, you know, paring down his uh, stake to make sure that the contributions happen towards his legacy building. And uh, the, the base level was uh, something at 40% that, that he had set. Right now, he's at 44.3% 44 uh, 44 holding in the company, well within that uh, stated objective and limit. There is also, he has been meeting certain fund flow requirements for uh, his objectives of non profit uh, requirements through a, a pledge and I'm sure he'll have that removed once this uh, once the proceeds of the sale comes through uh, into his account. So this is all as per disclosures made and in line with uh, what we have planned for the company. So you're saying there is further headroom for him to pare down stake a little bit though? Not immediately, not immediately, because you know he has raised a substantial amount, and this has to be applied for the for the good that he is uh, doing right now through Scan and Happiest Health. And at a later point in time, you know he has got dividend streams and other income as well to apply. So uh, he is best suited to answer that. But as of now, there are no immediate plans. I can say that much. Very important clarification which you have made. Uh, that uh, this is 800 crore or thereabout raised for philanthropic and non-profit work as stated earlier. So nothing great change in the strategy. Let's come back and talk about the operational part of the story. You have uh, maintained that a billion dollar in revenue by 31 uh, is the target. Uh, you know, the entire industry has become very challenged. Some companies such as high growth companies such as yours, of course, are doing a good job. But the growth from here on, what percentage of that growth or your movement between now and a billion dollar revenue will come on the back of buyouts and how much will it be organic? So just to put the numbers in perspective, from today to 2031, the company has to grow at a CAGR of around 22%, 22% and thereabouts. Last year, we did 11.5% in a challenging market. This year, including the acquisitions, we have, we'll be... We have our estimate is that we will do something between 35 to 40 percent and thereabouts. So if you look at it, and I'm giving it as an estimate because you know uh, when you do acquisitions, there are cutoffs for how much, how many months of revenues you can take during the cutoff period, the closing date, and all of that. We have closed both acquisitions, but nevertheless, uh, we have we have set out that estimate of about 35 to 40 percent. So this year, our acquisition plus organic growth. The strong organic growth we did 11.3 percent last year. This year we are hopeful of doing something similar or higher, along with acquisitions, puts us in the range of 35 to 40. And on an average basis, is getting us, uh, you know, back to the 22 percent mark and that billion dollar trade. From here, you will have to essentially again build on the the base of uh, the organic muscle that we have, and we will also have to add on uh, a couple of acquisitions as we, you know, navigate. This growth towards uh, 2031 and a billion dollar dream. So uh, that that's that's where we are. Look, then when it comes to the margin picture, can you give us a sense as to what it is that you're looking at? They're estimated to be in the range of 20 to 22 percent. Are you holding on to that um, estimation? And what would be margin drivers? Yeah, we are holding on to that estimate. Again, you know, 
uh, in the year of acquisition, you have acquisition costs. While you can, you do get benefits of acquisition, it takes some time to you know flow through into the PL, but there are certain investments that you need to make up front. So including those acquisition costs and you know the cost of integration, I've I've given a margin guidance of about 20 to 22 percent, and we are hopeful of doing better. There are two elements to it as well. Um, one is the companies that we have purchased are profitable. And they are at a relatively similar margin profile as us on the operating side. But we also had a healthy other income the last year because, you know, we had raised capital. And that was on my books for quite a period of time. That got me about 81 crores of other income last year. I still am sitting on a reasonable amount of cash reserves, 700 crores of rupees. But nothing, you know, it's not as much as 1,300 that we had last year. So that adjustment also needs to be made uh, while you do the margin. From an operating margin standpoint, uh, we are hopeful and we want to target between 20 to 22 percent. When I say operating margin, essentially I'm talking about you know EBITDA without the other income. Uh, it should be between the 20 to 22 percent. When you say that you're confident of increasing your margins as well, what exactly are the levers for margin improvement which you are applying? So last year we did a utilization of about 76.5 percent. If you look at our history. Uh, our utilization has been between 79 to 81 percent. That, 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 that was the range. While 80, 81 is very high, 79 is a healthy one. So 76.5 to 79, you have a heavy one. Second is attrition rates were higher in the past. You know, attrition requires you to replace people at a, um, at a higher cost. And uh, attrition rates today are at about 12 percent TTM, which, which means your cost is coming down. Third is we have been working on our pyramid. We onboarded close to 600 campus uh, campus and off-campus freshers last year. Uh, unlike other companies, we went ahead and made the commitment with the bullet, got them on, and they are going through the training session, uh, training period, and within the next three to six months, they should hit the, you know, the, the billable workforce, as we call them, IPS Minds uh, billable workforce, which, which uh, means they are revenue generating, even though at a lower utilization compared to almost zero in the last uh, year. So, you know, that also helps in getting our average cost down while also moving utilization and the efficiency up. So these are the few points that are growing in our favor. Uh, then we have the other things of, uh, we haven't seen much of price uh, pushback from our customers. So that's that's a relief for us. And it's it may be because we, we, we do not do cost plus, we do market or demand-based pricing, which is something uh, in discussion with customers. So we don't get price pushback. The second aspect is, uh, you know, there is a repeat sale. We, we do about 90% of my business comes from repeat business, which also has its impact on, uh, you know, margins. So with all of this, uh, the levers on margins are there for us to, you know, uh, play on or rather uh, optimize on, which is what gives me some bit of confidence. <clears throat> have you created Gen AI business unit. Can you just tell us a little bit more about the long term vision here? See, we have created a Gen AI business as a business unit, which means it's not like a COE uh, kind of a, a structure, which many of the other companies have done, which is fine. But from our side, we think we have to put it right in the front of the customer and both the customer and the markets have to see the investments that we make. So which is, which is again, going in line with the transparency of what we do. So we have made it a BU. The moment you make it a BU, you will have, we'll have to give report separate numbers, uh, right up to the margin. So that's what we want to do. Maybe it will happen this quarter, the next quarter, we'll start carving out uh, the business and its results uh, up to a up to a BU level, uh, just like what we do for the PD as an IMSS right now. So uh, we have carved it out as a separate BU and we hope that it will contribute at least 10% of our total revenue. Because if you look at it, IMSS is about 18 to 20% today. PDES is about 80%. So if a BU has to stand on its own merits and uh, have its own business structure and you know all the things that go around with that, you have to be 5 to 10% within a reasonable frame time frame, which is about, let's say, two to three years, it has to be there. You have to also look at it from the overall size of our business. We are about 200 million exit run rate last year. Uh, this year, right now, with the acquisitions, we are about 250 million, um, near about in terms of run rate. And if you're talking about 5 to 10%, that gives you a fair understanding of 
what we are seeing as a possibility for this BU over a period of uh, two to three years. You on board. Thank you so much for joining in and sharing with us your financial metrics as well as the long-term road ahead.